So I'm Mark Peek, uh, Principal Engineer with VMware, and my co-presenter is... Hi, I'm Doug Davis from IBM. And we're going to be going over the state of serverless. Um, so before we start, let's uh, get some hands going up. How many people know what uh, serverless is? All right. How many people know what functions as a service is? All right. How many people know the difference between those two? <laughs> Ah, okay, okay. So what we're going to do is uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what is serverless, why and when to use it, et cetera, use cases, and uh, then, then we'll drop into, uh, Doug's going to go over uh, some of the CNCF serverless working group, talk about that, and uh, some, of the, some of the futures uh, that we're going to be doing on that uh, working group. So... Before we start in on serverless itself, let's first talk about functions as a service. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that we've seen is the progression of uh, compute. You know, started with bare metal servers, went to virtual machines. Uh, obviously, you know, me coming from VMware, that was an important thing. In fact, I think it's pretty funny that, uh, you know, IBM and VMware are talking about serverless, but I digress. Uh, and so, you know, as we, as we move from virtual machines, public cloud, and then containers took us by storm a couple of years ago, and, you know, it's a wonderful thing. But as people have looked at how they want to uh, write their programs, how they want to consume compute, they've thought, you know, I really just want to focus on my business logic. I want to write my function, and I just want it to execute. And so that's one of the reasons that functions as a service is, is really interesting to people. Just, you know, be able to, to write the code, submit it, the infrastructure's already there, you have wonderfully fast startup times. Uh, when you look at density packing, you can, you can pack more functions in, into the same amount of compute and, and be able to schedule those across uh, a lot of different nodes that way. Uh, the other part of it is that as you're looking at functions as a service as a way to uh, break up your monolith, you, you can now write those functions, be able to, to have things that are very directed for the API usage that you need. So, you know, going along this, you know, what is it that, that we want to see in this function? Well, it's event-driven. What we want is an event coming in, some way to have an action occur, that will run this function. Uh, it will run this function. It may do some, some back-end work. It may uh, send, a, send an event back out. But, you know, it, it definitely will, will uh, do some work there. But it's also very short duration. Uh, the, the current cloud providers, very fast execution times. Uh, I think right now AWS is around five minutes. But, you know, it, it's not intended for long-running workloads you might be better off using uh, containers or, or VMs instances for, for those types of things. But as, as we see some of the, the open source projects coming along, I definitely could see that as being one of the areas where, where they can provide additional value is you can choose your own uh, duration. You can increase that and be able to control your own destiny there. Uh, it's definitely stateless. The, you, you just, you, all it is doing is providing the, the compute. You don't want to use any storage or so, uh, associated with that uh, uh, function runtime. Uh, you will rely on external services in order to store the state out uh, into backend services, or another way of storing state is sending another event back out to be you know, additional functions or to trigger other, other events to, to happen. I'd also say that one of the, the key areas is auto-scaling, because what you want is, as these events are coming in, the infrastructure will respond to uh, that workload coming in and will then auto-scale out the number of functions that you need in order to handle the ingest of those events into the infrastructure. And then, you know, public cloud is talking a lot about the lower cost which is you're only having to pay for what you use. When a function runs, you get, get uh, time billed to that, that's, that's your bill. So you don't, you know, this, this kind of dovetails into more of the serverless thing, uh, but 
it's, it's definitely a, a cost savings associated with uh, public cloud only having to pay for what's actually running. So what, is, what does this function look like? Here's a very simple example of a function. It's a JavaScript, has parameters coming in, uh, that's, it's being triggered by an event. Let's just say that it's an HTTP event. Uh, there, there's uh, parameters associated with that call. One of them is uh, a name. We look at the name and we say, all right, hello world or hello name if there's a name associated with it. Very simple. The, the JSON payload is sent back out uh, as, a, as a response. So when you're looking at how functions can work for just redoing your APIs, this is a, a very good simple example of that. And you know, it, it really is this concept of being able to control the actions running through your infrastructure and, and being able to chain together those functions. So what does this look like overall is you have the event sources coming in from a variety of different areas. You know, it could be computers, it could be web browsers, IoT, uh, phones, you know, all kinds of different devices will be contacting into your infrastructure. Actions occur, you know, a lot of people will say actions, triggers, events, uh, but it's all somewhat the same thing. It will then go into the function executor and scheduler. The event will be scheduled onto uh, more than likely a container where the function is running, but there are other uh, implementations that might have something other than a con container abstraction for that. And then it will provide the compute network and storage associated with that for the function execution. More than likely, as, as you look at this, it, it will use back-end services. So things like event buses, uh, blob stores, uh, other databases in order to uh, either query information, store information, but it, isn't, it doesn't necessarily need those backend services. It can be just standalone, do some compute, send the answer back out as an event. But it, it is this ecosystem that, that we're seeing. One way to think about that is that as you're developing your overall cloud native application, you need to look at uh, these components as design patterns that you use in order to create that application. You will use VMs and instances, containers, functions as a service, and the services themselves in order to combine those and create your cloud native application. And you know, I think what the important thing there is that as we move forward into the future, as we see uh, the, the whole serverless and functions as a service expand, what we want to see is more portability of how can I write my function and then be able to now deploy it onto many other clouds. I, and, I, and that's gonna be kind of a nirvana going forward. So now we're gonna take a step back to serverless. You know, this talk was about the state of serverless. So I talked about functions as a service and now what is the real distinction there? Uh, I'd, I'd say that this is coming more from a public cloud point of view where f functions as a service is how you actually run the functions, how you execute them, et cetera. Serverless, on the other hand, is the thought that I can just hand this function off to some infrastructure, someone else is maintaining it, someone else is operating it, I don't have to care about it. And, and so they will figure out how to auto scale it for you uh, they will say, you know, if it's not running, it doesn't cost you anything. And I, and I think that's a very important uh, point about this, but it's also in the eye of the, the persona. So, you know, one persona, the developer persona, it's always going to be serverless to them. To uh, the, the IT ops, you know, they might be providing a functions as a service infrastructure. So Amazon, Google, et cetera, public cloud vendors, they have their function services. They're providing functions as a service. We use it as serverless. So that's another way to, to think about that distinction between, between those two. And then as we, as we look at all of these you know, as a service, we have uh, functions as a service, 
platform as a service, container as a service, and it all starts in, in you know, Doug and I were talking about this, and it's all starting to blend together, which is it, there are subtle distinctions between all of these different services, and it's really, you know, how do you, what's, what's the smallest amount of code that it's executing that it needs in order to run, and how you interact with it. But, but I do see that there is this blurring of lines where you say, well, they, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people, they say, well, functions as a service, isn't that a PaaS? You know, because I just kind of submit my code to it, et cetera. And I'd say, yes, uh, but there's probably a finer granularity on the function that you're actually submitting to it. Uh, there's uh, differences in terms of how it gets auto-scaled. You know, PaaS may not do the auto-scaling for you. You might have to have more manual steps in order to bring more, uh, the number of instances up autom that isn't done automatically for you. So there, there's very subtle distinctions there. Another uh, distinction that I want to make is that you can decompose functions uh, apart from your application. So a lot of times you'll create your application, you'll have your, your gets, your puts, uh, different, different uh, routes, all in the same set of code. And with functions as a service, you more than likely will be decoupling those, creating individual functions for each of, each of, each of those routes, each of those endpoints, in which case then there is a distinction there where I can now upgrade or modify a endpoint independent of having to redeploy the entire application. So it, it's, I'd say that's another area to look at as to you know, the difference between serverless FAS and some of the, the uh, platform as a service and container as a service. So going over some of the, the you know, these, this is just a sample of some of the use cases that I've seen for using, using uh, serverless or functions as a service. Uh, you know, obviously I talked a lot about, you know, how do you decompose for microservices, being able to, to have APIs there. Uh, IoT is a, is, a, is a great use case where you have a lot of devices that may be uh, calling in. You can't predict when that load is going to happen, so you really want the infrastructure to auto-scale that for you. Uh, and you can have very discrete functions to handle, handle the, those inputs. Batch and stream processing. Uh, this is more of a using functions to orchestrate the data being that's flowing between all of your uh, batch and stream processing. And then there, there's obviously DevOps, your CI, CD pipelines. You, you can have triggers, fire, uh, IT ops. I, I can imagine being able to, to see, see issues occurring and be able, be able to uh, now say, all right, if I see this alert, I want to send the Slack message to this channel. If I see this other alert, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to uh, call out to PagerDuty and, and start waking some people up. Uh, let me also touch on a couple of uh, use cases that uh, I've seen. Um, this, is, this is more of an AWS use case, but I, I think it's pertinent, which is there's, uh, it was reInvent in 2016. Coca-Cola was talking about their infrastructure, where when you swipe your credit card to a Coke machine, that would trigger a Lambda function that would then do the, the, the charge onto, onto your credit card. So they, you, they are only paying for compute when you actually are paying for a Coke. And I think that that's a, that's a really good point about why you would want to use serverless uh, in, in some of your products. But I will also say that if you go back and look at that video, uh, it, they also talked about that there's a break-even point where if they have a low number of transactions, it makes sense to have that as uh, using Lambda. But as the number of transactions increases, it actually makes more sense to move over to dedicated uh, instances. So you really have to, have to look at your use cases, look at and model the costs associated with something like that to decide whether going for a functions as a service really makes sense from a, from a costing si side of it. Uh, and, and then uh, at serverlessconf.io, uh, I think that was in May, uh, there, there was a talk from Nordstrom about uh, they have a, it's in, in GitHub, fully open source, uh, Hello Retail uh, site that's written all in Lambda. 
But of course, if you, if you dig deeper into that, it, the, the functions are written there, but they're using a ton of back-end services. And I think that that's where you have to look at, again, your overall costing model. What does it cost to run the functions is one thing. How much is, are the associated services to store the state, to do the eventing, everything else? You have to look at that entire bill as you're trading off how you do infrastructure uh, with this. And with that, I'm going to hand off to Doug. All right, can you guys hear me okay? All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to talk about the uh, CNCF uh, working group. <clears throat> Excuse me. So even though a lot of people's hands went up, um, it, uh, when Mark asked about you know, who knew about serverless and functions and stuff, it is still a relatively new technology. And back in 2000, back in 2017, back in June of 2017, um, this, the Technical Oversight Committee in the CNCF decided, you know, there's newer technologies out there. Let's figure out what, if anything, CNCF should do about this space. And so obviously the first step in that process is to find out exactly, you know, what is serverless, what's going on in the community today, and then uh, see if there's anything we want to do in that space. So they basically said, okay, let's start up a working group and explore these various things. So one of the outputs of the working group was a white paper. And it's, as you might expect, its first goal was to actually describe what is serverless, what is functions, and what's going on in the community today, to find some common terminology, because each platform may have a slightly different term for things. Um, and what, for the most part, the working group itself was actually pretty boring for the most part, because everybody kind of was in agreement for most things, and we just had to sort of document what was out there, and that was fairly straightforward. Uh, but there were a couple of maybe contentious points in there, and some of these are things that Mark sort of touched on when he was summarizing this stuff. And one of them was actually zero cost when idle. Um, and for those of you who understand the way things like Kubernetes or Docker actually works, right, it's very hard to actually get uh, the scale of your application down to zero, so it's actually zero cost if you're not using it, right? The infrastructure isn't designed to work that way. In a lot of these cases, you can go down to one, and then it can scale up as needed, but to go beyond one down to zero, so you actually get real zero cost, that's a bit of a problem for some infrastructures. And so when we tried to draw a firm line in the sand that said absolute zero cost, that was a bit of a sore point for some people because some infrastructure can't necessarily get there. Um, and I'll talk a minute about how we solve that. And then we have this whole public versus private thing, which is, again, Mark did touch on this, because, again, serverless is supposed to be about you hand us your function, we'll host it, and you don't have to worry about anything else. And that's great if you're in a public cloud. But in a private cloud, well, obviously you're not giving the uh, infrastructure off to someone else outside the company to manage it. You're giving it off maybe to someone else inside your company, like an IT shop. And so there was a bit of a contentious point there because some people said, well, you can't have serverless in private cloud. It doesn't make any sense because you as the organization or the company still have to own it, manage it, pay for it. So that can't possibly be serverless. Well, in order to solve these, we basically did what Mark hinted to, which is sort of define personas or roles, right? We said, okay, you need to look at this problem from two different perspectives. There's the provider who's providing you the infrastructure, the functions of service infrastructure, versus the developer who just wants to hand over their code. And once you look at it from that perspective, you then you can say, okay, then it does make sense, right? Maybe I can then do this in private cloud because my IT shop will be the ones who absorb the cost, but from the developer perspective, they don't have to worry about the cost anymore. They don't have to worry about hosting it and managing it and stuff like that. So you can do this split within your organization and still get serverless, but it's only serverless from the developer's perspective, not from the IT shop or provider's perspective. And so that then led to this notion of, well, there's serverless versus serverless technology, right? Serverless is what the developer sees. Serverless technology is what the provider or the IT shop is gonna manage. And that's sort of how we sort of dance that fine line to not really upset some people who didn't wanna be not labeled serverless, even though they didn't necessarily fit into some other people's perceived uh, definition of serverless. But once you get past the, the definition of what is functions, what is serverless, as I said, most of it went fairly smoothly. Uh, so we highlighted all the things basically Mark talked about in his, in his part of the presentation, right? The use cases, areas where it's proven value, how do you differentiate serverless from PaaS, from containers as a service, or even VMs? All those things are just talked about there. Um, 
And we also went into a, a little bit of detail of how serverless works from a technology perspective under the covers. Now, we didn't, for example, take Lambda or OpenWhisk or anything like that and say, here's how this does it. Rather, we sort of looked at it in an abstract sense and said, what are the general things you'll see in the infrastructure of a function as a service or serverless infrastructure? Just so as you're looking through these various options out there, you're not surprised by some of the terms or some of the concepts that are presented. And finally, in the white paper, we then talked about, well, what should the CNCF do going forward with serverless? Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. All right, so the other output that we had, though, uh, aside from the white paper, was basically a spreadsheet of what is the serverless landscape, right? What are the um, uh, cloud provider serverless uh, uh, offerings? What are the open source projects out there? What are the development tools that are available for serverless or functions? And what kind of back-end services are people uh, making use of today? Now, this isn't meant to be things that are approved or you know, get a gold star or, you know, that we like or dislike. This is just what's out there today. So if there's something missing from this spreadsheet that you'd like to get added, it's a Google Doc right now. Just make it as a comment, it'll get added. We're not there to draw a bar or a line in the sand to disallow anybody. All right? This is just so people can go to one particular place and say, oh, what's out there today? So they can go play with it. All right, now, to the recommendations itself. Obviously, we need to maintain that spreadsheet going forward, as I just said, so feel free to suggest edits there. But going forward, we want to try to enable developer interop and portability. And in order to do that, you need to make sure that you can move your function from one platform to the next. Now, there are diff many different aspects around portability of the functions. And so rather than trying to boil the ocean all at once, we decided, well, let's focus first on events. Can we get a, a, a harmonized or agreed upon or interoperable format for these events, right? That might make it a little bit easier for you to make your functions portable. Not 100% portable, but a step in the right direction. Now, the other one we talked about was things like the, the function definition, right? The packaging of it, how you actually deploy it. That's all goodness too. That hopefully will be the complete picture for moving your functions around. But event, func event format was sort of the first one we decided we were gonna tackle. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. And then finally, um, any additional documentation we can think of going forward, right? Are there, are there is there, um, are there documents we could put forward to help people understand uh, more about the community, more what's going on in this space, um, the integration with other CNCF projects? Just additional things just to help out the community going forward. Those are things we're gonna look at producing in the future. So let's talk a little bit more about events. As I said, it's basically looking at trying to see if we can find a common sort of envelope for these events that come into the system. Now, we're not gonna necessarily look to mandate all events, for example, must be in an adjacent format or stuff like that, right? because that's gonna be difficult. We have a lot of existing systems, they're gonna send out events in particular formats, some in JSON, some YAML, some binary, XML, whatever. We're not necessarily gonna to try to force those people to change, but if we can maybe perhaps look at the wrapping envelope around that that go into the function, maybe to get a little interoperability around that is what we're gonna be looking for. And you'll, this is actually very similar to what we see happening with CNI and CSI, other projects within the CNCF uh, uh, foundation and looking to get that harmonization kind of at, uh, perspective. And it's important to note that events isn't actually just for functions or serverless. We actually do see events flowing into all types of applications. So we're hoping this will actually get leveraged by those other use cases as well, not just functions. Now as a starting point, we actually had several different options available to us and I crossed out the two at the bottom because yet, yesterday we actually had a face-to-face -face meeting to figure out how we're gonna start, right? Are we gonna start with a clean sheet of paper, take an existing specification, you know, what are we gonna do? And we kind of landed on this open events specification that was originally started off by um, Austin from uh, Serverless Inc. Uh, who took the initiative to go out there and talk to a whole bunch of different companies to try to see if there's some commonality that he can actually formalize in, in document form, and he came up with open events. We thought, okay, that's a good starting point, so that's what we're gonna start with. Now, that's not to say that we're not gonna look at, for example, uh, CADF from CNCF or the uh, Cloud Native Event Mapping document and, and use those as input, but in terms of a starting point, we have to start someplace, and we're gonna start with open events. Now, this is, open to everybody, so if you are interested in looking at some of this harmonization or interoperability around events, please come join us. It is an open working group to everybody. You don't even have to be a member of the CNCF to join in the fund, and we welcome you to join us. Um, so here are just some important links for you, links to the working group itself. We do have weekly calls right now at 8 a.m. Pacific time, links to the white paper and that landscape Google Doc if you're interested, and I believe that's basically it. Now, so thank you, but, 
We do have uh, other serverless tracks in this very room right after here. I just wanted to summarize what they are. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in serverless, obviously please stick around for those other tracks. And with that, I believe we have about 10 minutes for questions if people have any. Can you put the link back on? Of course. The pay, I believe the PDF is available. Is that right, Mark? You uploaded it? Yeah. Yes, the PDF is available from our little thing on the shed or sked, whatever you say. <laughs> Sit, sit again? Oh, I'm sorry, weekly, Thursdays. I'll, I'll fix that. <laughs> okay, oh, come on, it should be obvious. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a little bit of that. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, so for those who couldn't hear, the question is, is there a performance impact to basically dealing with these smaller little bits of functions as opposed to the entire application and then spinning them up and down, for example, going down, I assume going down to like zero instances, you know, the cost of spinning up that very first instance could be a lot, right? And I think that is a problem. And I, de depending on the infrastructure, they deal with it different ways, right? For example, some of the cloud providers will allow you to set up basically like a ping. That will ping your, your uh, function every now and then. So we, always, so we always have at least one running, or at least for a period of time. And then maybe after 30 minutes to an hour, even that will drop down to zero. So then there will be a, a, a performance hit for that first one to come back up. But at least for that third 30 minutes or so, you shouldn't get a performance hit. Um, there are other infrastructures that try to deal with that a different way. For example, uh, OpenWhisk will actually pause your container so that the startup time is very, very fast. It's not starting from cold boot, in essence, right? And that's how they address it. So there are lots of different ways that people are trying to, to work on that issue, and it's, so, but it is definitely something to think about. Anything you want to add? Yeah. No, that was good. You want to switch back to the oh. uh, schedule? There we go. Yeah. So in case you were expecting a demo from us, we weren't going to give a demo. But if you do want to see uh, functions as a service in action, there's quite a few uh, uh, projects up here that are open source that will, I'm sure, be giving some really good demos. Other questions? Um, so you talk a lot about the orchestration and how you're trying to get the uh, definition, I think, for the events and stuff like that come in the function. Are you guys involved with other groups, um, thinking like metrics, tracing, and all that, where that could come into place and have an impact on yes, serverless? Yeah, we're, we're trying to get some of those groups involved. I, is it Open Metrics? Is that the right name? I can't remember, Mark. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're trying to get people like Open Metrics involved in the working group as well. Yeah, so if there's something, or if there's somebody you're aware of that we're not talking to as you look at the working group thing, please let us know because we want to reach out to as many people as possible. Yes. So I wanted to dig a little bit more into this uh, kind of startup issue because it, it seems to me like there's, there's two possibilities. Either one, you're, you're coming from a totally cold start and you need to spin up and that has to take at least a few hundred milliseconds, right? Or you're already running, in which case, what is the advantage of serverless at all? Because you're not really serverless if it was already running. So how can you, how can you ever win? <laughs> Life isn't well, fair. I, <laughs> I, I think I'll answer that with, you can do uh, predictive analysis, which is as you start seeing more and more events coming in, you can start spinning up more and more in anticipation of the load coming in, and then scale it back down. Which, which, Auto-scale Yeah. Yeah. I, So, so, to, so to me, to me I, had, I had a similar question. Right? When I first came across serverless, I thought of serverless versus PaaS very, very similar. Right? You give away your code, they'll manage it for you. That's great. But the, look at this, the, the first second bullet, the first indented bullet there. When someone started talking about scaling your gets as opposed to your entire application, that was the killer app or killer scenario to me that said, that's cool. Right? Because I can now scale up a get, which is relatively lightweight, talk to a backend system, return data very quickly. I can scale that out to a million, but only have maybe 100 instances of update. Right? That to me means I can scale that up faster and have more of those than my entire application scale. So it's all about better resource utilization. 
But at a very, very high level conceptually, I, I do tend to agree with you. But it, but it like does require cool. a decomposed application. Yeah, so it's effectively yeah. smaller units of scaling. Right, that, that to me is right. one of the big points of it, yes. A question about security. Uh, focus of the KubeCon has been serverless mesh, which is about uh, authorizing and securing the traffic between microservices. Is there projects in the serverless the function space that are trying to secure traffic and authenticate functions to each other? I'm, I'm not aware of anything specific for serverless. Maybe, Mark, you know, but I would assume that in most cases, we're dealing with containers here that are running the functions anyway. So as Istio, you know, you can Istioize, if that's a phrase, your function container the exact same way. Because to the infrastructure, it's still just a container. So you can put that sidecar in there to get the Istio benefits, regardless whether it's a function or a full-fledged application. I can't imagine that being any different. I'd say inside of the public cloud. <laughs> I'd say with respect to the public cloud, you know, they definitely they have uh, uh, you know, IAM for AWS being able to provide some level of uh, authentication, et cetera. But on, on open source projects, I haven't quite seen that yet, but I think that that's gonna be, you know, kind of the next wave of things. And I know of some projects that are looking at how do you do uh, better multi-tenancy and, and other security across, the, across your entire FAS uh, implementation. So, you know, I'd say stay tuned. And uh, you know, this is what we, we keep using this term, it's early days. And, and so I think it's gonna be moving very fast. So I'm always curious how technologies develop and where they come from. Was this somebody working on a path that said, you know, there's a certain use case that I wanna fine tune it and as they got going, said, wow, this is actually something we can cleave off and create as a separate model of compute. Or was it somebody's PhD paper that they then thought, well, there's a real world application and brought it back? I actually can't answer that one, so I'm not even gonna try to guess. Mark, do you know? I, I'm not sure of that, to be honest. The, the earliest uh, instance of using serverless, I think, came from IronIO uh, quite some years ago. And I think that they were seeing just going from a PaaS to CAS to, uh, you know, just being able to submit a function. And that's the only history that I've been able to dig, dig out of that. And, and, then, and then obviously AWS came out with Lambda that is doing something similar. Yeah, when we think about cost savings of serverless, I think it's, it's great we think about infrastructure, but the real benefit that I've seen or heard talked about is really the benefit to the development workflow and how that's optimized. And the biggest cost of any application, in my experience, is actually the, the time to, to build these things. And so if you can optimize that, that's, that's really great. Um, what I'm curious of, my question is, where's the, the state of like debugging and tracing and incremental rollout and staging environments versus production environments? And kind of where is the CNCF feel like its boundaries um, uh, touch in those areas. You wanna take that one, Mark, or? Because to me, to me, it's all just containers, right? And so I would assume all the same tooling for logging and tracing still apply here in the same way, I would hope. And that most of the differences here is the, the, mech, the, the tooling you use to actually either develop your, your application or function um, and the tools to deploy it. But beyond that, once you get into the infrastructure level, I would hope most of it should be fairly common. In my opinion, I think that that's uh, kind of greenfield opportunities right now to have things that make it easier to debug, to, to actually step through the code, understand what the failure modes could be, even unit testing the, those functions, which are written assuming certain infrastructure, I think is challenging as well. So uh, definitely I'd like to see people think about that and come up with uh, good, good opportunities for that. So I think there was, wait, the gentleman back there, I had his hand up first. I was, <laughs> I was wondering if you could quickly go back to the slide about um, serverless versus functions. I think it was earlier. So um, the way you described it, it sounded like you thought of uh, serverless as functions plus additional uh, functionality. It was back uh, trying to figure out which forward one. a little more. Uh, that one? 
Yes. Okay. So um, was I correct in interpreting this as you think of serverless as functions plus kind of this not worrying about the server? Um, because I would think of serverless as kind of more general than just functions. Like, you know, if you look at like ACI or Fargate, that's kind of like a serverless container product. You look at App Engine, it's kind of serverless source to uh, deployment system. So I was just curious on your, your view of whether you think of serverless as purely a function system uh, with that server, like serverless property or you think of serverless more generally. My answer to that is that serverless could be things other than functions as a service. Because really, when you're looking at it, it's, a, it's more of the managed service, backend as a service. Any of the services that you're using along with functions as a service are, could be considered serverless. And I think that if you take kind of this definition of it where you're not having to pay money for when it's idle, et cetera, that is the that it encompasses all of those types of opportunities. Yeah, I, I think we're out of time with that one. Oh, one more. Okay. I, was, I was just gonna amplify one thing on the serverless part. Um, serverless means not having to provision or think about your instances. So in the sense of, you know, hosted database like the <coughs> Google Spanner could be thought of serverless if you're not having to provision specific Spanner instances and it just scales when you need it. And the problem I'm running into, though, is that when you, when, you, when you talk about serverless as strictly at that abstract level, then you get back to the question the gentleman over, over there asked, is, well, what's the difference between that and PaaS? Is it really just scaled down to zero, or is it more than that? And that's where it gets a little fuzzy. I think a PaaS could be serverless, it, but it, it's not always. True, a PaaS could be serverless. I, I, I agree. But it depends on your perspective, and you'll get, you know, those are fighting words to some people. So, <laughs> all right. Great. Okay, thank you. Appreciate everyone coming. <laughs>